Thanks everyone for tuning in. This is episode 11 of the a Design Unholstered Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Costa, and today we have Corey, owner of Superior Defense. Uh, a lot of people asked uh, to get Corey on this podcast. We did a podcast on the Fort Knox podcast, which Corey runs. Uh, we did that, God, four years ago. But uh, now, now you get to be on my podcast, man. How are you? I am not bad, dude. Also... I think we did two podcasts together, dude. Oh, yeah, we did do two podcasts together. <laughs> but that, like you said, it was a while ago, so it, that should have, like, we should probably do another one, but you know how life is. It's crazy. I, I don't have to explain to you, right? Life is fucking wild. So life Also, wild. Am I, I'm going to curse a lot and for everyone. I know you know this, but I curse a lot, so just if anyone has sensitive ears, I apologize. Oh, I dude, you, I swear like a sailor, dude. <laughs> <laughs> i'm a sarcastic asshole <laughs> but you are too shit that's true oh so um you also so you have your merch brand as well or your production brand right Mm-hmm. so um for the bunch of people who probably don't know what i do or who i am um or my background i can touch on background real quick sure. is i am a merch guy by trade uh, my profession before I opened a gun shop, which I owned a gun shop in California, which was Superior Defense. Um, I was a touring merch guy. So my background for a decade plus was literally playing with fucking t-shirts every day of my life. Summer, winter, US, Canada, all of Europe, I did t-shirts. So now, outside of Superior Defense, um, which has turned into a merch company, I actually own a merch company called House Party Distro to where um, we make merch for a bunch of brands within the firearms community and some other stuff that's not as interesting. But yeah, so that's kind of my background. That's the quick and dirty one. Um, I obviously am super into answering all of these questions because people ask me, how did you end up here? Right. You know, and yeah. And you, and you used to do <laughs> you used to do stuff in the hip hop industry. You've done Lady Gaga. You have a uh, for people that don't know, like you were an asshole on the B nine boards years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so B nine. So like we both Corey and I both have like hardcore backgrounds. We like hardcore and like you know punk rock and pop punk and stuff like that. And there was a record label in Boston called Bridge Nine. And I mean, they were the uh, record label that scouted. Actually, my English teacher was one of the talent scouts for Bridge Nine, and he was the one that found <laughs> Jimmy World in a basement show. Um, so you used to, they used to have a forum, like a blog on their website, and all the fucking music dorks would go there, all the elitists, and they would just shame people for liking certain bands and promote other bands. And it was a time where MySpace existed, so you could. You know, bands had their own MySpace pages and uploaded their shitty MP3s. But um, yeah, you were you were a fucking savage on that. You were a so, scumbag, <laughs> you know, in a, a playful of, way. Yes. <laughs> so the big thing with B9 Board, and I'm sure you and Albert Defense Tim talked about this, right? Did you mention B9 Board with him? Yeah. So we did, but he never. He's not tech savvy, so he was like, <laughs> I didn't ever spend any time on it. <laughs> so the best part about B9 Board and this will be this will tell a lot about me right and you know this yeah. of course like you said sarcastic whatever <laughs> b9 board was a magical place that existed in a time period to where free people saying flex it was a flex that you had a early join date i remember my join date on b9 board being like 2005 or 2006 yeah actually probably even longer than that i think it was and like 2004 ish it probably was that yeah that old and for a lot of guys who don't understand, the for a forum, a true forum, not a Facebook forum, not any of these other bullshits where you can just get moderated to death because you posted something they don't enjoy. B9 board, outside of hardcore, outside of just any random hobby thread that would get started. Do you remember Dead Juggalo Baby? Yes. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> Dead Juggalo Baby, like one of the wildest things that I've seen on there. Along with, uh, were you there for bug chasers when they found the bug chaser no. uh, forum? Okay. So if you don't know what bug chasing is, I don't want you to look it up no. now. <laughs> but if any, if you're interested, go look up bug chasing. You're going to hate yourself. It's the worst thing possible. 
B9 board was this place. You, like you said, make fun of someone for listening to the wrong band. Someone found that there was a guy on, you know, doing porn that was wearing <laughs> some hardcore band shirt, and that was a big thing for a week. And then it turned into harassing people on other forums. Oh yeah, it was just roving drama. Uh, I remember it like was when the wildest. Oh, it was like the wild west of forums. I remember like when Boston Beatdown came out, then everyone started uploading their own beatdown videos, and yep. um, it, it's just and and for people that don't understand, Boston Beatdown was a video that a bunch of fucking assholes and hardcore bands produced and FSU produced to just show how violent they really were. And uh, back in the day in, in these, you know, we look back, right? And we're like, oh, yeah, there was a bunch of pit crews and all these people went by three letter acronyms. And you're just like, you're like, man, these are we were in fucking gangs as kids. Like we were like mm-hmm. legitimate organized crime gangs, you know? And then, um, I mean, fuck, it's, it's mad funny because we I was watching like Gangland like 10 years ago and FSU was on it. And you see Colin Campbell, Colin Arabia fucking haymaker moby in front of the axis in boston and knock him the fuck out and then you know three years ago i'm sitting at my barber shop and i'm like colin campbell's getting his fucking hair cut his hair's gray he's got a little bit of weight put on and i went home yeah. and i i typed up this whole thing like oh, I, I bumped into colin campbell at the barber shop he's got you know like a beer gut going on and he's just <laughs> the same asshole voice that i remember like he knocked me out with a microphone when i was a kid so, and I just remember seeing that and he got tagged by someone else that we have mutual friends. And that's when Facebook allowed you to view mutual friends pages. And he was like, he friend requested me. He was like, I don't have a beer gut. Okay. I gained some weight when I got out of prison. I was like, sorry, <laughs> but now we talk all the time. And, He's a cool dude. Right. And dude, it's crazy because my experience and my life that existed within hardcore, um, even pre music industry, I worked at a venue called chain reaction in Orange County. So if you've ever been to shows, um, you would know what Chain Reaction is. Yep. If you've ever seen any fucking West Coast hardcore shit, film the Chain Reaction right. or Showcase Theater. So I was very fortunate, and I know you know East Coast, like Connecticut, and like all that stuff over there. Stuff uh, New England, you guys have a lot of good venues. We right? had hundreds of venues. Mm-hmm. So Southern California, we had good venues that would consistently put good shows on. I was very fortunate to work at one. Right. So when I worked there. Dude, I was watching Terror, you know, and all these bands that I was super stoked on weekly. Right. And then there would be shitty other hardcore bands that would play in the middle of the week or whatever. And and as I started getting older and understanding how cool music actually was and understanding that it was really rad that I saw Fall Out Boy play to fucking 60 people. Right. Like, you don't understand. Like, I, don't, I, I didn't understand how cool that was until I was, like, fucking almost 30. Yeah, no, it's awesome. I I saw the first Half Heart show and they opened for Youth Attack, you know, and you're, and it was at the Falmouth VFW, which is where I'm from, Falmouth, Mass, and it was a shithole, and there was like twelve people there, you know, yeah. and it's and then it's amazing how far that that music travels, you know, and then mm-hmm. uh, B9 like was cool, MySpace was cool. People don't realize that MySpace was like, you'd go to local shows. And like learn local like local bands and like big Boston bands would come through like we had Death Before Dishonor, uh, Since the Flood, Cool Dudes Chillin, uh, On Broken Wings, um, Barrier Dead was cool for a minute, but they also play like the Sons of Italy and all these like local tiny yeah. ass venues. Uh, Wilhelm Scream. We'd have like good like the Movie Life came like good just cool shit right. And mm-hmm. um, but then when MySpace kind of hit the scene and we started getting involved and you could. You could put your top five favorite songs on it and shit. And then it was like, that's when we like, that's when we realized that like there was a West Coast scene. Like, oh, fuck, Terror. Like, Terror's rad. Like, Hate Breed. Mm-hmm. Everything that was outside of our little niche in New England. But like, you know, then you got into like the New York scene. I, I never like, I went to one New York show, but I like kind of stayed away from New York as a kid because we were like, couldn't afford the gas, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, you know, got to see Madball as a kid too, though. So. Did you see Madball just did that show? in central park yeah and a bunch of people were so fucking mad and first off my my experience with madball is i wasn't really into madball again like you say that's a new york hardcore thing i like i like judge and i like you know a bunch of these other new york fans but it's that shit of dude freddie madball is one of the wildest people right dms crew just a 
just that fucking dude. All that energy from him. And keep in mind, he's started Mad Bull when he was like 10 years old or 12 years old. Right. So he's been carrying this for the last fucking 40 years. <laughs> I was out with Ice Cube. I toured with Ice Cube um, for six years consistently. And I remember being in Switzerland, standing on stage. And our, our shows were our, – all of our shows were always closed stage. Right. And – Freddie Ma- Madball is standing behind me, and he's like, hey, dude, is it cool if I stand here? And I'm like, I know who you are. This is insane to me that you're playing this massive festival. Because back home, it's like CBGBs was the best thing that you could have ever played. And outside that, you're playing PFW phones. Right. And you're you're talking to me, and I, like, I'm the merch guy. I'm just trying to watch my boss. You're a fucking Freddie Madball. It's crazy, man. Hardcore, hardcore <laughs> is the best and worst thing that has ever happened to me in my life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like it, it, it was kind of like trial by fire as a kid. Like Tim and I were talking, and like he didn't really have a rough upbringing. I didn't really have a rough upbringing, but you know, you kind of got that the hook gets set. You get punched in the face for the first time. You get fucking knocked down, and the pain goes away. The adrenaline dump kicks in. And you just fucking get back in there. It's like man, it's kind of like an addictive culture. Um, it's a cool culture though. It's a it's a it's a character building culture. You know, but like you said, the DMS, and then I grew up around a bunch of FSU dudes, so all the fucking JV FSU kids would come down from, like, <laughs> South Shore, and they would come try to fuck shit up, and uh, no pun intended there, I wasn't trying to, like, pair that up, but they would try to come in and fucking hurt people, and there were some tough fucking kids on South Cape and shit like that, and the Cape scene was actually pretty fucking hard, um, so, you know, then you'd get crews fighting each other, and again, these are fucking gangs. Like, a- as an adult, these kids wore bandanas and marked their colors and shit, and you're just like, damn, this is, like, legitimate, like, gang activity, if you think about it. And I remember, like, when FSU was, like, in my eyes, was cool as fuck, when they were, like, fighting Nazis and pushing Nazis out of Boston and doing bad stuff. And that's stuff. what they were there for, right? <laughs> yeah, but now, now, like, they extort venues to hire security. And if you don't, bad oh, things happen to, your ven- <laughs> it happens to your venue. <laughs> absolutely. It's really fucking weird, man. They went from robbing drug dealers for cash and pouring drugs out on the drain to selling drugs <laughs> yeah. it got real weird for a while it's so weird i know some like old school fucking fsu dudes locally and you know they're still running security off security stuff and <laughs> you know it's good for them i mean if they're not arrested by the fbi yet then good for them but <laughs> um yeah it's just amazing the hardcore hard, hard, hardcore culture was cool it was it was cool to be part of and it was cool just like saving up your money to buy merch and merch was cool, dude. Like, it was really, like, prolific, grimy, like, 90s-inspired merch at the time. Like, what everyone's chasing now for mm-hmm. merch. And, you know, looking at, I said to Tim, like, looking at the merch tables back then. Like, Tim, a lot of his stuff is super inspired by, like, oi bands and oi band cover uh, covers of music. And people don't understand that. They're like, ah, oh, Albert Defense's designs are tight. And you're like, well, that's the reference. You don't know the reference. The reference is fucking right. awesome. <laughs> and a lot of your references are kind of similar, too. You pull from your background of, yeah. of music. And that's super important. That's something that not a lot of people understand. Like, almost nobody understands. And I'll say this, too. Um, hold on, my FedEx dude. Thanks, man. <laughs> I'll say this. It's it's very interesting because I've said this a lot on my own podcast and, I, and you know I've had this discussion with a handful of people within the industry. The gun world, um, most of these people don't have other hobbies and they never had other hobbies. So right. by the time they got to this and they're just trying to fucking just ingest and take in everything as po- like as much as possible. Like, dude, I did a Metallica bootleg, right? And guys weren't into it. How are you not into that? Metallica is fucking tight. Oh, I know why. Because you listen to Five Finger Death Punch means you don't like Metallica. (laughs) Which, dude, for for the record, um, I will say this. I haven't told anyone this. Um, The Metallica stuff that I did, originally I pitched that to Magpul. Magpul turned it down. Fuck. So... It was, I was basically, I was like, hey, I want to do this. Um, don't sue me. That's all I asked for. I didn't want it to be a collab. I didn't want it to be shit. I literally was just like, don't fucking sue me. And they were like, nope, sorry. We're not going to let that fly, essentially, in the long legal version of however this works out. And then I release it. And like, what, four months later, there's Milo Ventimiglia. Um, every dude here, their girlfriend or wife will know who that is is spread across every single tabloid 
you know, in the U S it's been two months. He's wearing this shirt front and center, leaving the gym. And it's been plastered across TMZ, like every, everything. Yeah. He, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's wild. It's, it is wild. It, it's fucking wild. And it's fucking funny. And fuck the <laughs> dorks that don't like the Metallica bootleg. You suck. Listen or to better Metallica. music. How do you not like Metallica? Dude. You have you have pot you have a fucking playlist right? Well, we kind of built one together too. We have that Spotify playlist that we kind of like pigeonhole together. I have three pod, uh, not podcasts, playlists on Spotify now. Like, listen to better fucking music. Stop listening to butt rock. Uh, butt rock. The Midwest is a big place, man. Oh, it's everywhere though. It's like you talk to these kids, like, "What's your favorite band?" They're just like Caesar, and you're like, "What? Uh, <laughs> Shine down? Oh my yeah, god!" Yeah, they love it. <laughs> oh you so, listen to metal yeah i listened to five finger death punch no it's not uh, oh my fuck he's got a red dude. ferrari with a matching ir <laughs> fuck off yeah that's supposed to be light but it's not light so <laughs> it's funny that you said earlier you brought up cbc um <laughs> it's kind of tough to even explain uh cool dudes chilling the band cdc if you can explain their merch i without making absolutely everyone offended i could tell i would tell people to go look for it's a kiwi green shirt with pink screen printing the don't even remember what the front said that's fine if you look at the back that's what the that's the one that matters yeah <laughs> do you know what you're talking about i i believe i know what you're referencing <laughs> i mean just to put cdc in a fucking like in a box uh i forget the lead singer's name but he would come out on stage sometimes he'd wear his glasses and he was blonde hair, blue eyes, tall, skinny, lanky dude. And he would literally strip down to his boxers. And he would dance He would dance on stage in his boxers. And he just loved himself. And all the fucking scene girls would go wild because he was in his boxers. Oh, yeah. And he would just fucking smash on stage and smash the crowd pretty much half naked. Like, I don't understand how bands like CDC existed or um most of these bands realistically how these guys have all been so tough and just such tough such assholes <laughs> to everyone and now that i'm more involved in the firearms industry community whatever everyone here is so fucking soft right yeah and i'm thinking about like growing up riding bikes and being at the skate park if you have beef with a motherfucker we're fighting yeah absolutely how come how come guys in this industry are so fucking soft while CDC releases, you know, the most edgy, just dickhead ass merch on the planet. Like if I wanted, if I really released the stuff that I actually wanted to release under Superior Defense, guys would be so fucking butthurt. Yeah. It's the best. I mean, when your gang <laughs> vocals are roadhead block parties after every show, like, mm -hmm. all right, that's, that, that's, that's CDC. <laughs> Like, fucking horrible, horrible, you know? But, um, you know, I just, I miss, like, the guns up, and I never got to see kids like us. Uh, that bums me out hard. Mm -hmm. Did they, you ever see X-Files X? No. That was, like, I think the most north they ever came was, like, New York. So, yeah, big bummer. X-Files X is fucking awesome. But I saw shitty bands like Life Ruiner. <laughs> <laughs> Straight edge <laughs> revenge. Dude, fuck, life ruiner. This is and straight <laughs> fucking edge. Ooh. I mean, dude, I grew up in Southern California, so I <laughs> definitely uh am still straight edge like a total fucking nerd and definitely have X's tattooed on my ankles. I also um have seen Throwdown a million goddamn times. <laughs> dude, Throwdown's like fucking fun now. But Well there you sound like Pantera now. Yeah, yeah. The it's kind of funny. I was at a wedding a few years ago, and their wedding song was uh, my friend Ashley and her husband, and, uh, and he's kind of from Boston, and he's kind of aligned with the DVD dudes, but um, yeah, it was fucking Friends Family Forever. <laughs> it was their wedding song, and they did pile-ups, and the person that DJed their wedding was the community police officer from our high school, this uh, oh, Officer wow. Cheryl. It was the fucking weirdest but funniest like wedding, and it was just like, oh, their 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 fucking song is them moshing in their tuxedo and dress with everyone screaming "Friends, Family, Forever." It's like, where am I right now? Hard, hardcore, 
<laughs> hardcore definitely put me in a good position in my life for especially working at venues which rolled me straight into touring which obviously has led me to being a coop fucking merch guy right like before we started this I was like, oh dude i need to find a hat i need to put a hat on <sighs> um i'm literally looking at 60 hats that are all different on my desk which are all samples and i walked out to my car to get a different hat <laughs> <laughs> it fits <worst>. you nice <laughs> hey man it's got a house on it. I drew this house. That's a nice looking. My drawings are. That's a nice looking house. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just one of those things. Like, I just put together like a really comprehensive pop punk playlist because I was like, man, pop punk for me is like summer, dude. Like, it just mm-hmm. that absolutely. It's that summer vibe. That all right, let's go drive to the beach and listen to fucking Newfound Glory. And people are like, oh, Newfound Glory, that's fucking name. It's like, shut the fuck up, dude. Chad's harder than you'll ever be. <laughs> like, <laughs> he was also in a band called Shy Halud, but that was also super tight back in the day. I like their original album. Listen, I like Shy Halud. I like Chad. I like Newfound Glory. I like superheroes. Oh, I don't like Chad. Uh, <laughs> I hate Chad. <laughs> I don't have beef with dude. My experiences are much different than, than most people. Yeah. Full pause. Now, everyone hates Scott Vogel. That's fine. I like Scott Vogel. I've had so many different interactions with them. So, and God, I'm such a fucking terrible hardcore kid, right? So, 2007. So, <laughs> best year, uh, best year for music, yeah. though, for people that so are listening. In, in 2007, I was on a tour called Rock the Bells. Yep. Rock the Bells headline tour would have been, or was, Raging Against the Machine, Cypress Hill, Wu Tang Clan, uh, Jedi Mind Tricks, MF Doom, like oh, this wild fucking tour. Um, I ended up hanging out with Jedi Mind Tricks and becoming friends with Vinnie Paz. So I'm literally at this wild venue and I'm standing at the back door and I'm trying to get into the venue so I can go to work, play with t-shirts. And Scott Vogel is standing in front of me and his credentials don't work. So I'm in this weird situation to where I've, lo- I've moshed so heavy in my life, right, to fucking terror. And Vogelisms was a the funniest shit to me. Thank you, B9 Board. And Scott Vogel is in front of me and can't get in. And he's trying to hang out with Vinny. Yeah. So I ended up sitting in this trailer after I get him in. I'm like, listening to Vinny and and Vogel argue whether or not Comeback Kid is bigger than Terror as a band. <laughs> what? And, and that's fucking amazing. And, like, Tim and I were talking about that. We were saying, like, Vinny, Vinny Paz, murder, rap. Like, I mean, he's got lyrics like this is Taliban rap and I'm a fucking bomber. And the dude yeah. wears like terror shirts and Chapter mm-hmm. Rice shirts. And he loves heavy metal and hardcore and pop punk. I mean, heavy metal, heavy metal kings, man. It's fucking rad though. So yeah, they're complete. So they're arguing over. Com- well, what do you think? I think comeback kids bigger than terror. I think current. Well, he- now when was the last time now. comeback kid has released anything. Mm, last time I saw a comeback kid was, Seven, six, six or seven years ago. So probably okay, nothing. Let's let's see what two thousand. I'm gonna say two thousand fourteen. They released their last album. Two thousand seventeen. Okay. There was there there was a record in two thousand fourteen. Okay. I'm pretty removed from hardcore, um, mostly because I listen to so much trip hop and fucking house music. That's another thing too. Is once once hardcore got me to where I got me to where I was with my music taste. Then it started to be like, okay, well now I like. Why do I like Fugazi, right? <laughs> yeah, you right? should never. You should. You have straight edge tattoos, so you like Minor Threat, and then it turns into why do you like Fugazi, and why if I'm listening to Fugazi, why am I not listening to other bands? Right. Like most people can't even tell you who Yeah Yeah Yeahs are, but they're fucking banging. And now it's the shit of like, oh dude, Comeback Kid. They released a record in 2017. I didn't know that. I stopped listening to Comeback Kid in like 2008. Yeah. I mean, and that makes sense. Like, we also have similar, like, female lyric, uh, musical tastes. Like, I listen to Lana Del Rey, Taylor Swift. Love her. Um, Love her. Uh, what's the other one that I've been listening to? I, um, I also listen to, like, blues. Like, I listen to Melody Gardot. I, I was, I've was i been jamming out to the Rat Pack uh, Spotify lately and Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. Like, I enjoy quality music, quality lyrics. Um, not oh, garbage. I see your... I see your fucking pop punk playlist. I'm about to fucking boop. But doop. 
It's tight. There's actually yeah. uh, Tim actually contributed that too. There's a couple new New Jersey bands that are the first two bands on the list, and they're fucking bangers. I see. This is the thing about pop punk. Um, as I'm like looking at this right now, <laughs> I missed on a lot of pop punk because it was the shit of. For me, I like Blink 182. I like. I hate Alkaline Trio. Just getting that out of the way. That's okay. Um, <laughs> so I kind of. Oh, I see. Set your goals on here. Love those dudes. Um, Story so far. Oh, good. Yeah, I like I, Four Year Strong. I did a tour with these guys. I like a lot of this stuff, but there's a lot of things that I missed on purely because I was already getting into touring and heavily at, in the hip hop world and just being surrounded by uh, Crips and Bloods and Nation of Islam dudes all trying to kill each other over <laughs> fucking set colors. So I miss a lot of the pop punk thing, which I should revisit, especially now that I'm like 900 years old. So I, I, what, I like, put to, this list, some of these bands on this list, I actually did not listen to, but I did a lot of digging when I built this list and I listened mm-hmm. to like probably 50 albums in the past three weeks of bands that I was like, I never listened to this band. And I was like, wait a minute, this band's fucking awesome. Like I listened to No Use for a Name when I was a kid and I have like three mm-hmm. or four other albums. I didn't realize they have 14 fucking albums and they're all good, you know? So I was like, damn. Um, I added I some stuff that's... One. Okay, go ahead. Bands you didn't... I'm looking at this and I also see Say Anything that is on here. If people aren't familiar with Say Anything, Banger Tracks, Max Bemis, the singer, absolutely batshit fucking crazy. Full pause. P.O.D., oddly <laughs> enough, a weird band that no one should ever like. I did a show for P.O.D. in Hollywood, and somehow I knew every single fucking song they played. I didn't even realize they had more than one song. Yep. I was wrong. Apparently, I knew all of them because I have a radio. <laughs> um, bands that could have been really good but got fucked over by butt rock mainstream radio, Unwritten Law. Do you remember Unwritten Law? Mm-hmm. They could have been good, dude. They would have been like borderline pop punk at the time, and then they had that unseen red, that bullshit sucky yeah. song that hit the radio that everyone liked. But they're, I mean, you have to if you want to make money. <laughs> but they're like their other shit was good, dude. If Hoobastank didn't go mainstream and stayed underground and actually kept producing like decent albums, they could have been way cooler. But they got another band out. I see on here is Bayside. Bayside is one of those bands that was a very big transitional band for a lot of hardcore guys, right? It's like, oh, you like Newfound because Chad was in fucking Chai Hulud. Right. I like Bayside. Why do you like Bayside? I like... Uh, well, it's like hard. I'm like, I never really got into Bayside. Not a terrible band, just never got into it. Uh, saw them two years ago. His voice mm-hmm. is fucking timeless. And my wife hates his vo- hated his voice before going to see him live. She's okay. like, his voice is super fucking annoying. And then we go see it live and she's like, oh damn, like this is fucking fire. His voice is great, actually. He sounds fantastic. Um, I have some bands that aren't pop punk in there. I did throw in a little bit of glass jaw. Like a... I hate that band. <laughs> I don't know Sorry. why. Their new their new <laughs> shit's hard as fuck. Um, okay. I'll have to listen. I'll have to revisit Glass Jaw. It's been about a decade since I listened to Glass Jaw. It's the lyrics, I'm, dude. dude. I'm scrolling through it. It's the lyrics, man. You gotta go back and like look at the lyrics. His lyrics are like suck on the end of this dick that comes lead. Like just like the little fucking faux pas in his music. Like he had a, a, mm-hmm. a, a secret track on one of his albums, and he's singing about his ex. And like under his breath, he says "fuck you," and you gotta crank the volume to hear it. Like there's just like little Easter eggs through fucking everything. That's why I've always liked, um, like the Brooklyn Bench. scene. Movie life, dude. I am the avalanche. That's like I see this. good Some stuff. brand new on here. Only, only two albums. I've seen all of these bands at, when I worked at at a venue. That's crazy, man. Music, it's crazy, especially especially subcultures, right? And I'm gonna I'm gonna change kind of change the subject here. A lot of people don't understand subcultures, right? And I'm gonna keep going back and comparing shit with the firearms community because let's be real it, it's it's why we're here while we're talking right um comparing everything to the firearms community is is going to be a big thing but you can be into hardcore you could be into punk you could be into all these things you're into music like looking at this this list right like I, i'm telling you i don't like outline true 
as to where motherfuckers are still arguing whether or not AKs or AR-15s are better guns. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. It's comical. <laughs> and this is a good playlist. There's, there's some, a lot of fucking tracks on here. There's some bands that like are borderline pop punk that I was like, it's just it's just niche enough and on that fringe of pop punk that I had to add it. Um, like I love fireworks, dude. Detroit is a banger. Yeah. Uh, Handguns mm-hmm. is a good is a good pop punk band. I mean, I put Polar Bear Club on there too. It's not. It's kind of mm-hmm. like indie ish punk, but it fits. I put like the this first is Thursday close album. Enough, dude. Well, first off, I just scrolled over fucking AFI, which I've decided this in the last week actually. Um, a fire inside is what I'm just going to keep continuing to call them, so people don't know what I'm talking about. Yes. Um, <laughs> I really, really, really like AFI. All of AFI, including what's the Sidecars is new project with Tony from No No Doubt. Yes, Sidecar. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, even his newest Tony. album was fucking good, dude. His mm-hmm. there, or yeah. yeah, the second album. Uh, no, the newest album was really good. Um, I threw Boxcar Racer in there because it was good at the time. Um, a mm-hmm. bunch of the original Blink One Eight Twos, obviously. Yes. Um, there's bands that I didn't Did listen you talk to. About- what, go ahead. Did you talk about this playlist with Tim? No, not at all. Okay. <laughs> I uh, don't know if he's allowed to listen. He, to so no, he approved it. He loves it. Say yeah, anything is say that. anything's one of his favorite bands. I back that. He he posted say anything in his story a couple weeks ago, and I was like, no shit. He was like, yeah, of course, dude. I mean, he contributed a little bit to this list, but he approved it. He gave a stamp of approval. Um, I mean, yeah, there's some good shit in there. Um. Oh, dude! Another one that people don't didn't really get into, but it was great. Was North Star? Did you ever listen to North Star? Mm-hmm. That Pollyanna album was fucking tight. Mm-hmm. I do like that. But uh, super bummer. A lot of these bands, like Story So Far, dude, they could have gone so much farther. Set Your Goals could have gone so much farther, and I don't know what caused those bands to break up, but they like their their albums were so fucking good. I actually know Matt Wilson fairly well. He's a super fan. He's a super fantastic fucking guy. Total weirdo. Um, he's from San Diego, so his his dad actually owns an ice cream shop. I spent some time with that dude. That's like cool. him. Um, God, Set Your Goals. It's wild to like look at this playlist. Like, Fuck, I haven't heard these names, these bands in a long ass time. Well, what they were saying was relevant, though. I mean, on their the last album that they produced, they had a whole song about don't trust your government, don't trust what the media is putting out, find your own conclusions, build your own, mm-hmm. you know, build your own conclusions, do your own research, and uh, you know, stick it to the man. You know, and a, and a lot of a lot of that in the 2A community is just like, you know, do your research and actually fucking learn. And there's a lot of that in music and, and music is the absolute number one elevated protest. You know, you can. Right. You can push whatever you want in music and it's fucking great. And people forget that. Yeah, just uh, don't meet your heroes. I'll tell you that out loud right now. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah. All right, dude, let's switch gears and we'll talk about music all day long. Yes. All right. <laughs> so anyway, you a lot of your stuff was influenced by music. Um, mm-hmm. You know, let's talk. So I think it's really cool. You're probably one of you're probably the pioneer. I mean, you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I think you were the pioneer of drop culture in the firearms industry today. Um, I'm going to correct you and say that I ain't shit. So that's how I feel about myself. I think I was probably one of the first people to start saying no to re-releasing things. Right. Um, and setting, like you said, drop drop culture, but like setting date and time. And once it's gone, it's gone. And, you know, a lot of people will compare Superior Defense to Supreme. Yeah. Which it's – I don't compare it to Supreme because – Supreme doesn't hasn't done anything interesting to me since the fucking early 2000s. Right, of course. Is there similarities? Yeah, sure, but people people just see that, right? Drop. Oh, it's a drop. It's a drop, and you fucking sell out in 20 seconds. That's the similarity right there. Um, but yeah, yeah, okay, I'll agree with you. I, I would say I'm one of the pioneers of doing drop culture. I mean, not it for merch. For merch, bags, right. equipment, soft goods. Mm-hmm. Like, there's always been drops for guns, right? Oh, this mm-hmm. fucking SIG X5 bullshit. Like, there's only 10 of these made by them. They're fucking $4,000. You know, this yeah. is this is a investment, right? And I look at drops 
and soft goods as consumables. They, they get, are 100%. I get holes in my shirts. They fall apart. Like You can preserve them if you think they're that great, but they're just going to sit in a drawer, right? So wear your shit. That's how I've always looked at Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, I don't understand the aftermarket of drop culture. I don't understand why people are paying $350 for a fog hat. I don't understand that either. Um, Donate the money purely... to charity. <laughs> so the thing, the thing that blows my mind with Forward, um, obviously most people know that I have a relationship with him, with the dude and all the other guys that are involved in it for the most part. Um, same with 176 and a couple of these other fairly large, you know. I've met them all. Say, mm-hmm. I'm a quick I, I don't want to say lifestyle military brand stuff. No. They're just dudes to me, right? So yeah. with the forward stuff, the thing that they that he does is really wild is why are you paying three hundred and fifty dollars for a hat that's going to be produced again? He the only stuff that I know a hundred percent for certain, um, and he's talked about it and he's still talking about it, is people are really hard up for the Patagonia hats and all that merch. Patagonia fucking slapped his dick. He got a fucking cease and desist. Um, there's that's the only stuff. And and uh, I will say this, and we, we may disagree on that. If you want to spend that much money on Patagonia shit from forward, that's the stuff that's never coming back. He can't make it again. Right. But all the Dodgers hats, all the yeah. the, the Boston hat, all the, he continues to make that stuff. Wait for the motherfucker to make more. Yeah. Now, going back to what I do, I'm not going to re-release. The same exact thing. Right. If you're fucking patient, there will be more. Right. I also don't understand why, how, why, and how most people, if I release a, a, a full run of things for 24 hours for a presale, a, how did you miss it? Especially in the age of information, how did you miss it? And b, why were you, why, like, what were you doing that you went a whole fucking week without knowing it was happening? So the whole 24 hour period that it was in existence that you had the ability to purchase. Right. Well, pause. I get it. Some motherfuckers are crazy busy. They have all these wild things going on in their fucking life. You have shitty friends. They should be buying merch for you. Exactly. And I've... <laughs> fuck, dude. I've had friends buy merch on drops for me, you know? Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm not... I don't go after drops. I mean, I'm... This is going to sound like a flex, but fuck anyone who thinks it's, it's a flex. Everyone, um, no, I'm friends with most of the people that do drops. So I'm just like, mm-hmm. yo, how can I, like, I'm not going to sit there and try to get on the drop. So how right. can I just give you money now? Tight, you know, and it's not a big deal. And, um, and I think it's really cool that people like, get super energized for drops. Like I do try to participate in the DEF CON drops because it's always a puzzle to try to mm-hmm. figure out how to make the purchase, which I think is fun. Um, you can even get the website to fucking unlock. For oh, your like website. last time I had to like, <laughs> then I had to like highlight the text because it was hidden. And then I realized that's how you can hit the ad to cart. But like, there's always something fucked up purposefully. And um, I, I, I find it like a game, you know, and I, and I have gotten a pair of DEF CONs. And it was funny. I was in the airport and this kid comes up to me. He's like, you're wearing the DEF CON multicam ones, uh, multicam black shoes. Like, why are you wearing those? I was like, because I got them. Or, or where'd you get them? And why are you wearing them? I was like, I got them on a drop on the drop and I'm wearing them because they're fucking shoes. And he was like, mm-hmm. uh, Oh, uh, okay, cool, man. Like enjoy them. They're, they're pretty <laughs> awesome. And I'm like, they're just vans, dude. They're fucking $70 vans. They're shoes. And, and a lot of guys too, that don't understand drop culture and not saying don't understand or just, it just goes right over their fucking head. This goes back to what I said. They have no other hobbies. They've never been involved in any type of subculture shoe culture doing releases the way that they have been doing releases forever that includes fucking nike that includes adidas all these massive fucking companies the, if you remember this the very first not the very first the re-release of defcon right so defcon was the design group within vans then they started doing their full releases under defcon as a media company right the original three pack that they did which was arid tropic and multi cam black you could only get them from a fucking skate shop. So you had to know where they were getting released for vault release, and you had to be there. Right. So imagine them making, you know, whatever the number is that they made in those shoes, and then being lucky enough that you live not only near a skate shop that had them, that carried them, most motherfuckers didn't even live in a state that had a place that sold vault shit. I hit you up. Crazy. Like, yo, if you're going to go to the skate shop, grab me a pair of DEF CONs. And then they're like, oh, it's going to be a, a web release. And I was like, oh, cool. Awesome. <laughs> you yeah. know? And, dude, 
people miss so much of that. That's what we're very fortunate with, right? With with B9 board and all these other things. Um, what's I forget who it was, like Bill Burr or some one of those fucking comedians talking about. Didn't have the internet back in my day when you were trying to find out about music. You found out this motherfucker was playing because someone was wearing a shirt walking down the street. And you had this conversation. Or with a him, flyer. Like, oh, are you going to be here next week? Yep, flyers. Flyers, dude. So, mm-hmm. Dude, think about, think about this. And I'm obviously fucking now wondering. If you were into another subculture previous to firearms into what we're in now, you know all of the fucking stops you need to pull to make what you to get what you want, right? Right. So remember pre Facebook obviously B9 board, blogs were a big thing for a lot of fucking just communities in general. Yeah. Huge in the chopper scene. It's not really a thing in the firearm scene. And a lot of people are starting to figure out that, you know, once Instagram's gone, or once we've all been booted from Instagram, they're going to have to figure out a new way to get this information. Right. Uh, newsletters. Like topics. No, but it's, it's, it, you're, you're 100% right. We are actually, uh, my buddy Pat was in the car with me today. We, um, I'm buying an FNC and a, uh, um, a Set Me L. <laughs> are those both? Um, both post samples? Uh, they are both post sample no letter guns. Ooh, very nice. Uh, if you do you have your SOT again? Mm-mm. Uh, I was gonna Not say there's a uh, I got some <laughs> homies. I got a homie that's selling a bunch of no letter guns. So okay. But um, <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, uh, we were just talking about that, and uh, fuck, where did I got distracted by the guns thing? What were we talking about? Uh, blogs and oh yeah blogs so like we were talking about he was like what happens when Instagram goes away like he, these companies that do drops go away and I was like no well yes and no okay so we've been like really really pushing our newsletter hard like trying mm-hmm. to get people to sign up because if Instagram was to disappear tomorrow where are you going to find that information well we have a private Absolutely. Facebook group called the Super Super and our design Super Secret Friends Club and it's like a yep. joke, right? But there's like 4,000 people in it and they contribute all the time. They ask questions, whatever. And I and I make sure I try to hit everything. Um, we've got like 40,000 people on our newsletter. But that's the way, historically, anyone's ever found out information about what's coming out new in a company mm-hmm. uh, before our social media. So um, get on your newsletter. Sign up for notifications when things come into stock. Like just be smart about it. Because um, yeah, Instagram could shut us all down tomorrow. Uh, we have a YouTube. I'm doing Twitch now. I'm doing Twitch streams. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to like expand our digital footprint so that if Instagram was to cut us tomorrow, we still have plenty of avenues to get information out and give people an opportunity to adjust, pivot, and, and make that make that Absolutely. change. But yeah, I I know I have friends that kind of do drop culture gun soft goods, and then I'm mm-hmm. like, "What's your newsletter looking like?" And they're like, "I don't have a newsletter." And I was like, yeah. "So what happens if?" your Instagram disappears tomorrow. How are you going to advertise your product? And they're like, right. well, I don't, I don't know. I have a couple vendors. Why would I, well, why those, would I do that? Those vendors aren't <laughs> going to pay to market your product. You know, it's on a website because it'll eventually sell. So, you know, how do you protect yourself as a brand? Right. For the long term. Because fuck Instagram. But. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the worst thing, right? And especially I tell people, a lot of guys coming up, you know, and they ask all these questions of how would or why would, and it's like, dude, it's in front of your face. You have to look and see what the big guys are doing, right? Firearms, regardless of all the politics that are involved and how every fucking day it's an attack on our right shit, you look and see what everyone is doing else around you, and it, apparently it fucking works. Why would you fuck with it if it right. works? What's Nike doing that you're not doing, right? In the in the in the small picture, what what is um, any of your favorite brands doing? If that works for them, in the sense of getting your their information to you, why aren't you doing that? So, yeah, <laughs> newsletters they work. Yeah, they do work. Don't just flag them as spam. If you actually care about a brand and believe in a brand, yeah, just delete it if you're not right. interested at that time. But don't flag it as spam because that's that's an alternative livelihood opportunity. The more 
the more emails get spam flagged, then the new your your newsletter becomes more ineffective. Google and all the other browsers decide to bounce your emails. Like it is an mm-hmm. extremely important way to connect with the companies that you're buying from. It, it's I just wish more people would read. Like we, I don't know about you, but I pay a lot per month to have my my website managed from our website management mm-hmm. company. Um, I have done three reboots to my website over the past eight years. Those reboots mm-hmm. are like, you know, just shy of ten grand each when you do a full overhaul. Right, it, absolutely. Well, over five, at least over five and a half, six grand, right? And then, so you're paying for your service fees, you're paying for your reboots, um, you know, you're putting all this money into like search engine optimization, uh, and then you take the time to write really high quality copy. Now, for people listening, copy is a product hey, speak description. For, speak for yourself, not me. <laughs> I right. can barely spell my name. <laughs> right. So, I mean, copy is just like, you know, this optic mount does this, and this is why we built it this way. And it, you're not going to have a zero impact if it's an out of spec rail. Right. So it, it just, it kind of blows. Like we had a guy recently buy a new con arm arm mount, right? He put a hollow sun 507 C on it, which has a battery tray underneath. That's really thick. It's thicker than an RMR, so he couldn't even co-witness his irons that were built into the R- the Ukon because they were hidden by the body of the, the Holosun, which is fine. So he messages and goes, "I, th- this this these irons are shooting left." I go, "How can you even see your irons? They're not even co-witness because the the actual optic is too thick to co-witness." Right. This was built for an RMR. He goes, "But that's not the point. If I try my best to line it up through the body, it's still shooting five inches to the left." And I go, what is this mounted on? And he responds, a KR9. A KR9 has a polymer riveted to the sheet metal dust cover made in America AK. That fucking thing is crooked as shit. And you're going to put a, a, a hollow sun that doesn't even allow you to co-witness on top of a plastic polymer injection rail that is riveted to a piece of sheet metal that the holes on are probably off because it's stamped fucking sheet metal but it's our fault that kind of shit blows my mind but again it's like maybe i look at the world differently because i'm an engineer i i can i know how everything like i have an idea or the theory behind how everything's fucking made i look at oh this gun was this an extrusion was this a fucking you know like whatever it is this rail was extrusion was it billet whatever I can like actually disseminate those things, but you know, I guess for normal people, common sense goes out the window. I mean, we get people that order inside the waistband right-handed holsters and they're like, they're like, Oh, they clip it onto their belt on the left side of their body and go, why did you send us a a left-handed outside the waistband holster? Hey, I get it, man. I deal with it every day. Just like you do. Well, you don't get to anymore. No, we have great (laughs) customer service reps. Jake and Justin do a fantastic job politely and carefully answering emails, making you feel good about yourself unless you threaten us. Yeah, which is a common thing. Do you ever get the threats? Like, buyer's remorse is fucking hilarious, dude. So I get the... You took... Such an... You you took X amount of dollars from me. First off, I didn't take it. You fucking gave it to me. Um, And then I get the... During uh, Q4 last year, you remember December was very fucking terrible, and even fucking Q1 of this year was really terrible for the post office. So we were shipping out fucking tons and tons and tons and tons of stuff, and I had guys hit me up and they're like, hey, why the fuck did you send this package to Tennessee? I live in Texas. And I like look at it and shows the tracking bar and it shows in still in transit like still going to destination and i had to have a convers i had to have a legitimate conversation with the person who called me an asshole and told me i blamed it on the post office that i sent it to the wrong address right motherfucker it was still being delivered to fucking texas i don't know why the fucking the put like i responded to this dude i was like hey man it's gonna take me a couple years before i have the ability to actually send direct packages to the correct post office once i get a job there I can't help you. <laughs> like, what? Once it leaves my fucking my shit and it's scanned by the post office, how is this my fucking fault? Yeah, that's the biggest one. It's like mostly shipping stuff because we talked about it, man. Like, 
if I buy a whole shirt from fucking Amazon, it'll be here in three days. If I order something from you, I know it's going to take X amount of time. The right. website told me. Right. Same motherfuckers probably have never actually done any NFA stuff, right? Like, you buy it, and when it fucking shows up, you shoot it. Until then, you don't have it. It doesn't fucking exist. Shut the fuck up. Sit down. Four years I've waited for this and brand, too. And then you get a can. <laughs> or a machine gun. Or whatever. Right? Um, no, it's, re- it's real talk, dude. And it's like, it's uh, the worst is like, hey, this says it was delivered, but it's not at my house. Okay, we're not U.S. Postal Service. Contact U.S. Postal Service. Talk to your mail person tomorrow. See if they delivered to the wrong address. Oh, can you do that? No. I don't know what your local hub is. That's not our job. It says on our website that once it leaves this facility, if you did not purchase insurance, it's not our fucking problem. Now, I had a guy hit us up, and he was like, well, I have a, we, have a, we have a package theft issue, and he puts in the notes, please deliver to back door. Well, we're, we're not the U.S. Postal Service. I can't put a note on the shipping label, please deliver to back door. Like that, the U.S. Postal Service delivers your fucking package where they deliver your mail. I, and, and if you have a theft problem, then have it delivered to another address. Or put a security system up. Like, we are not responsible for your home security if you have a package theft problem. Right. And this, and without complaining too much about this, right, because this is the business owner to business owner yeah. discussing the bullshit that we deal with on a daily basis – which makes me fucking think about whether or not I actually want to continue to do this because people are fucking assholes. Now, full pause. Um, I should quit doing this because people are assholes. <laughs> <laughs> or just hire someone. If you can afford it, hire someone to do it for you. It is absolutely the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm still holding on. Right. Like I, there's a lot of stuff that I don't do anymore, but I'm still fucking holding on to that last one before I just am not responsible for a lot of things anymore. <laughs> it, it, but it's important that that's like one thing as a business owner to like letting go. Right. So up until like a year and a half ago, I molded every single fucking holster that came through my shop, mm-hmm. every single holster. Um, you know, and if I had to travel for business or if I had to go to fucking Europe or I had family or whatever the fuck, and I took that time off, I'd come in and work 14 hour days for five days straight to get fully caught up. So the, so the dudes had work to do and, and I answered the emails and I did all that other shit. And then it was finally like, man, I can't fucking do this anymore. Like this will kill me if I keep doing it. I need to Mm -hmm. hire more people to do this for me. I need to pass along my knowledge to someone else because I will burn myself out to the point where I just won't do this anymore. And finally being able to say, here you go. Here's the reins. You are a stud. Take it away. And now right. it's great. You know. Do you have an assistant yet? I don't personally. Um, <laughs> I don't have an assistant. Um, we have an operations manager, Justin. He's um, he's done a couple roles in the shop, and now he basically does shipping, customer service, managing, and um, he does like invoicing and stuff for vendors. That's a lot of hats. It's a lot of hats still, and we're still. You know, we still want to take some of those uh, uh, responsibilities away from him so he can do management better or he can do other things better. So we're still growing. We still need like two or three more roles. Like I want a domestic right. sales guy. I want an international sales guy. I want a shipping and logistics dude. Um, uh, you know, a couple more, but we're not quite there, you know, and it's we're close, but we're not quite there. And do is everyone at A&R, are, they, are you, or are you, or you handling um, Utah? So, okay, so I have a contracted engineer that we work with. I handle all the uh, design aesthetics, uh, document control approvals, and future design rev- revisions, but I'm not actually doing 3D modeling anymore. I have passed that hat on to a buddy of mine who was actually with me today. And I'm just like, I want it to look like this and do this. And then I have two engineers that work for me that I'm like, oh, we're doing this military project for velocity systems. And this is what it needs to look like. And this is how you're going to build it. This is how the tool is going to be constructed. And this is how it's going to work. And if you execute it this way, there will be success. And, right. and I will draw it out on paper. If they need me to do some CAD, I will. Um, if they need like more technical side drawing, I can do it. I got SOLIDWORKS. We can fucking do it that way. 
Um, I mean, we're working on like breaching explosives, holding uh, holding systems, um, other breaching system uh, retention systems that we can't really talk about. We have a new project that we just finished up with Velocity Systems that we are in two weeks we're gonna fucking blast out to the world. I told you about it last night. But it's going to change the game a little bit for some things. And it's going to be cool. And people hopefully like it. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Um, if Velocity Systems like it, that means it's fucking quality. So uh, I like those. Dude, I like military R&D development projects. That's where I'm at right, right now. So my role right now at a is pretty much uh, media marketing because I still do all. So we have a media guy. He's awesome. He does all our videos and photography. But I'm the one that's kind of controlling that the output of media to the internet. Right. Um, and I do international uh, and domestic military and law enforcement sales. And I do um, document control for the Anvil Ucon stuff um, and testing. And I do a lot of the equipment testing. So. And all of that stuff with, with Anvil, you're running it through ANR's website? Or yes, it's a brand it? of ANR. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so people that are listening, we do optic mounts, firearms accessories, mag wells, stuff like that. Uh, we have a 193. Uh, we have a new mount coming out. You had one of our prototypes from our old, 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 old style. Once I we get do. Our... It's sitting in my safe on an upper I don't shoot. Uh, we got some new stuff coming out. We're coming out with offset 45 versions okay. for RDSs. Um, I have something really, 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 really fucking cool coming out. Uh, I have a riser coming out for like Eotex, which will be pretty tight. Um, yeah, a, a lot of really neat stuff. Well, Romeo 4T version is coming out pretty soon. Uh, our 193s are going into production. Our 193 T1T2s are going into production tomorrow. So we should see those fairly soon on the web store. And it's, it's doing really well, dude. We got... That Ukon RMR one, the original Ukon, actually got NATO stock numbered through UK Ministry of Defense. So that's going to be a, that's NSN. People that don't understand NSN, uh, there's national stock numbering and there's NATO stock numbering. And if it hits the national stock numbering, it's also NATO. So basically it's a fucking yellow pages for all NATO countries in the United States to purchase Mm -hmm. uh, defense articles and goods. and they get a special number. So if you have a Cat 7 tourniquet on the back, it has an NSN number. That's the number that someone looks up when they need to order 2,000 of them for whatever military unit. Uh, so yep. once you get things that are NSN, it's like the big leagues. So we actually, we have five, six, seven. We'll have seven items uh, NSN by, we have four items NSN right now. We have three more getting NSN by another country uh, pretty soon. So. Nice. Very nice, man. Congrats. Thanks. That's but that's like the, for us. That's like the next step is getting right. your, your NSNs and getting your goods that way. You know, we service uh, twenty two countries right now. A lot of things that we don't talk about on Instagram because at the end right. of the day, I make plastic buckets for guns. Like it's, <laughs> you know, like I make plastic buckets for fucking guns and magazines. Like that's at the end of the day, it's a holster. Holsters aren't sexy. Like they are, but they aren't. Some people think they are. You know, I never wanted to be a holster maker. <laughs> you know, I just, I was good at it. I fucking worked in molding. And, but the anvil side is the side that I have a lot of passion for is like creating those things because right. I've always wanted to make gun parts. <laughs> so, I mean, dude, this is the, you already said it. You never wanted to do this. That's what you're good at. A lot of people don't understand that, right? So I didn't want, I don't want to be a fucking merch guy. I fucking, I don't want to have an office job. I toured for a living. I fucking don't want to have a boss. I don't, I'm that person. If I could be outside all fucking day, fucking off, that's what I would be doing. I'm sitting in my office. Not only am I sitting in the office for Superior Defense, I'm sitting in the office with House Party, and I have a business partner with House Party, and we are behind the scenes on so much shit. Right. That's the pro. And, you know, talking about it's not sexy for Instagram, but at the same time, man, like, a lot of people start need to start seeing more of the behind the scenes shit right. because they don't understand what the fuck goes on. Right. We we did that for a while, man. I used to walk around the shop with the stories on Instagram and show people the back, and people love that shit. But we got to the point where we had so many employees and it was a clusterfuck in our shop. I was kind of like, I'm, I'll be I'll be 100 percent. I was embarrassed. Like we just 
too many dudes in too many cramped spaces. We're in like a 150 year old mill building. The roof would leak on a daily basis when it rains. Uh, we'd lose heat in the winter time because the landlord wouldn't pay to get the boiler fixed. Uh, third floor of the mill building with no insulated roof. So summer, it would be with four ACs running in the unit. Um, it would be still 100 degrees. I'd have to send dudes oh, home. Yeah. We'd have rolling brownouts through the building all the time. Um, we didn't have control over our own electricity. The kids next door to the recording studio would uh, put two, they would put insulating foam over the fucking electrical box. It would overheat and trip breakers. Like, it's just been a fucking nightmare. And we're finally, like, moving out of that shithole. And we're in a fucking brand new uh, remodeled space. It's gorgeous. We have our own AC unit on the roof. We have our own multiple layers of security systems, cages, safes. Like, it's, it's the dream for our business. And we have enough room to put, like, five more CNC machines and add, you know, ten more people. Right. So we have the growth, the expansion now, and we're pretty pumped, dude. But it takes a long time to get to that point. People don't understand. A lot of people thought I was like this huge fucking company. And up until like a year and a half ago, pre-COVID, we had five employees. Now we have 10. Right. You know, like we doubled at the beginning of COVID just because we're so fucking busy, which is great. It's awesome. I love providing for people. I love providing jobs for uh, local dudes. Uh, We do like 4% matching 401k. I do uh, 70% paid uh, Tufts Gold PBO Healthcare Plan. Like, we do a lot. We do quarterly raises and bonus opportunities. There's dudes that get fucking raises and bonuses every quarter that have, like, just skyrocketed. My lowest paid employee is probably, like, 18 bucks an hour right now. God damn, nice, man. So we don't, we don't, we're not skimping. You know, I, I talked to some people down south, and they're telling me that they work for fucking, you know, smaller gun-related companies making $12 an hour, you know? And I'm like, man, if I was in the south, I'd be fucking, it'd be so cheap. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, well, it also, they just give houses away there because you have to live in the South. Yeah, oh, I want a double wide and 60 acres for 60 grand, tight. <laughs> but, you know, it is what it is, man. It's just it's just growing pains, and we're really happy. We're in a place that we're really happy with. I have a crew that's fucking stellar. I, I can't complain. We have a bunch of new dudes. They all seem fucking awesome. Um, but, I mean, and do you have employees? Um. So, between myself and my business partner for house party we have a guy who comes in and does all of our fulfillment um and then we have project-based fulfillment stuff this is the good thing right um my overhead as you're aware is pretty fucking the the, the fluctuation is zero to a hundred right so i can have 10 pallets in the back of my fucking warehouse for a week but then i'll have nothing in it for a month right and depending on the products, you know, I don't really, I don't really need to have employees. I have an assistant. Um, I think he died from COVID. At least he <laughs> told me he had COVID or something. I don't know what has happened to him. He just hasn't been here for the last two days. But I do have an assistant just because there's consistently between the handful of brands that I do um, run myself or are involved in. There's always shit that needs to get shipped out. So I have him to do that. But outside of that, man, it's solo. I'm still holding on to that low overhead and uh, doing the customer service. If I, if I wouldn't do anything over again, but I do see a lot of like soft good designers that OEM their shit and then just mm-hmm. use their OEMs for fulfillment and don't have any fucking overhead and can work out of their fucking house and never have to lift a finger or, or keep stock. And like, that's kind of the fucking life. But at the same token, um, that's too soft for me, man. I like, it was really cool building a fucking business this way. It's it's super fun, um, and I will agree with you on the wouldn't do it over situation. I wouldn't do it over. You know, my growth came with the final straw for me when where I ha- so for anyone who's still listening to the shit that I have to say, Superior Defense as a whole was an FFL. Um, I had a storefront, and everyone always asked me, "Hey, you can open a storefront? Fuck you, no. It's not worth it." There's no money in selling firearms. That's part of the reason why I started selling fucking t-shirts and stickers, you know, mostly to friends was so I had the ability to pay my fucking goddamn rent because when you're in a gun shop, especially in Southern California, I was surrounded by other gun shops. Gen 3 Glock 19s are fucking $4.99. Anything Gen 3 that's legal in California, four fucking ninety nine. Right. Some shops were getting away with selling for five seventy five. I couldn't do that. So... With soft goods, dude, you know, and especially as I moved out of California when I moved to Vegas, 
it was that situation of this doesn't take a lot of space. It's not fucking regulated. I have the ability to fucking do it fairly well. I have a good support system with it. Um, you know, house party. So now it's the shit of, I ran it and I lost my fucking train of thought. God damn it. Um, no money in guts. Storefronts are hard to manage, hard to terrible. Yes. Terrible. And going to the low, you know, the low overhead, the last straw for this was I had six pallets of shit in my garage. And that was the, fuck, I need another shop space. Right. Yep. It happens. But, but now, yeah, as soon as that growth happens, you know, what, a, <laughs> what does Mike Jones say? He says, you don't work, you don't eat, you don't grind, you don't shine. If you're, and you know this with your fucking CNCs or anyone who works in a fucking capacity for production if your shit isn't running you're not making fucking money if your warehouse is empty you're not fucking making any money right exactly but now i have a garage space which is cool yeah super <laughs> cool and i mean a lot of people too like so people will be like what do you mean there's no money in guns right so okay this sig x5 at the pro shop mm-hmm. this gun is uh, this is vaporware right you can't these are fucking they don't make them um that gun was probably like 3200 bucks MSRP at SIG Pro Shop when it came out. You know what SIG, like let's say let, the SIG Pro Shop is a gun shop, right? So they're buying mm-hmm. guns from SIG Corporate, stocking them, and then selling them, and then turning a profit for the Pro Shop. So let's just pretend the SIG Pro Shop is just a gun shop, and they got access to this gun. A gun shop would pay $2,700 for that gun, maybe turn a $500 profit mm-hmm. on on an inventory item that costs twenty seven hundred dollars. Now you're looking at a Glock. Glock uh, on RSR right now, like a Glock Gen Five is fucking four hundred and twenty dollars or something like that. And you have to sell it for five fifty to be competitive. You're only making seventy dollars on a fucking gun. Yeah, if and that's the big thing with firearms. One hundred percent is right there. Is you will make. If you're fucking lucky, 20% on almost fucking anything. Right. Now, that's why you're seeing a lot of these companies starting to do soft goods is because they figured out that if they put their bullshit fucking logo on it, someone will buy it. And there's a lot of other things that go into it, right? It's not just, oh, let's make t-shirts because people buy t-shirts. You wear t-shirts, you wear hats, let's make them. Um, Gun shops, free, and I will say this, that I... I strongly believe I was one of the first people that had a gun shop that had strong fucking merch. That wasn't a thing before. Right. That's a skate shop thing. That's a fucking bike shop thing. Right. That's every other fucking industry, auto shop, all of those things. That's something that no one was really doing. Right. Um, in the firearms community. So it's, it's wild. But you um, see it now. FN has a, a strong merch line. Uh, SIG. SIG had a bunch of designers come in. They have a strong merch line. Um, you probably don't see it as much, but I see it because I'm close to the pro shop. But they right. have goofy ass, funny shit. They have gun related stuff. They have clever, you know, clever stuff. Um, you know, and, and, and it comes down, man. Like the money's in accessories, like you said. Like if we're doing distribution and we have a distributor, it's like we want to buy four thousand holsters. We're like, cool, forty percent margin, boom. You know, yeah. uh, forty five percent margin, whatever, depending on negotiated terms. But that you know, it's huge, right? And with soft goods, when people start getting into the merch and the soft goods and the nylon goods and all that shit, and they're having these bigger margins, they're like, oh, damn, you know? So we've always said that to gun shops. Like, we know you like selling guns, but you know that there's no money in guns. Push these holsters. They'll sell. People will love them, come back for more. They'll do well. And all of our vendors that have actually advertised our holsters have done extremely well. Um, But my other favorite question that I get on DMs, someone will be like, Hey man, I got this Glock Gen 5 and I've shot it once. Um, you think if I bring it back to the gun shop and I trade it in towards something, they'll give me like $400 back? And this goes back to how much guns cost. That gun shop right. paid $420 for that thing new. You took it off the lot. Now that gun is used. They can sell it as a used gun. What are they going to sell that used gun at? What they paid for it initially, so they're going to offer you two hundred fifty bucks because they still want to make that seventy dollar margin. So these people are like, well, and I, I tell everyone, if you're going to sell a gun, sell it fucking private sale. Sell it to your buddy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but you know, like, if, sell, 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 sell it private sale. Private. Sell it private sale because you legally fucking can follow your local and state laws when you sell it private sale. But sell it fucking private sale. 
you'll get more of your money back. Going to a gun shop and trading in a gun, you're going to get shit all back and you're going to feel offended and you're probably not going to support your LGS after that because you feel like they're fucking you. But guess what? You're Absolutely. fucking them. Sell your friends. <laughs> I don't disagree with you. Um, that's, that's another thing too, uh, which we can roll right into. Uh, pretty, uh, this is probably going to be a brief one because it'll turn to be a rant. A lot of people, like you said, sell to your friends, sell it to, you know, gun broker or these other, these other places. A big thing um, that I also have to deal with is a lot of people being upset about website stuff, right? Like, you see a lot of the comments. Um, I don't really deal with it a lot anymore because I kind of found a really good spot to where I'm at, to where my hosting and all sort of shit. But you see a lot of people complaining about websites crashing and, and carts getting robbed and all this other shit. A lot of these people don't understand, and this goes back to talking about selling firearms, where are the places you can sell firearms online, right? It's the same places that you have the ability to fucking host for websites, right. host your store, who take your credit cards. They're all very small time because we now, unfortunately, live in a fucking age that um, motherfuckers hate gun owners. So it's difficult for me to be able to find a website that even has the, you know, that wants to host my shit, right. even though I don't sell guns. Um, Huge. Yeah. <laughs> Try That's insurance crazy. companies. Um, oh, I'm aware. <laughs> like, getting insured for a holster company. You know how hard it, it took? It took four months to finally get insurance companies on board. And then they put us on a two-year probation period that we had no incidences, lawsuits, whatever, uh, issues with that. Like... And, and this comes down to margins again. Like, we're sitting here being like, oh, you know, there's 50% margins on this. The average viewer might be like, oh, that's a ton of profit. Like, that's – if I do the math real quick on what you sell a sweatshirt for versus what you might pay for it versus your profit margin, you know, you're highway robbing us. Well, guess what, dude? There's fucking overhead. We have workman's compensation insurance. We have liability oh, yeah. and umbrella insurance. We have um, the health care, health insurance, how much we pay. We do 401K, so we're paying that. We have the overhead for the business, um, but all that stuff adds the fuck up, and that percentage oh, yeah. of margin gets whittled down to a sliver, and that sliver is what you get to put in your bank account, and pray to God you sell enough that you can grow a little bit so you can afford new things for um, you know infrastructure growth within the company. You know, yeah. We've been doing A&R since 2014. You know, um, could I have done things differently? Is there ways that I probably could have grown faster? Could I have got a, an investor? Yeah, sure, but I don't want to owe anyone money. You know, I started with two hundred and ninety bucks, and we've never owed anyone money, and we have been profitable every fucking year. We've never had anything less than seventy five percent growth every year. So, and that's special. And that's fantastic. <laughs> that's super special. And then websites, dude. Websites. I mean, the amount of money I spend a year ho between hosting and all the services and the and the the monthly services and then the licenses and. You know, we have we have three million combinations of holsters on our website. That's a That's lot of wild. management on the back end. And people don't understand that. And our website's bombproof. And our website uh, designer and developer does a shit ton of gun companies. So if anyone's looking and they're having issues with their website failing through, dur during drops, let us know. Uh, we hooked up a ton of ton of companies with our our, our web our web provider, and it's worth it. Protect yourself because, yeah, dude, when people are complaining about websites, websites are fucking expensive and they're fucking expensive yep. to maintain. Security. What about the security? Your credit card information goes into our website. Look at all the ransomware bullshit going on. You need a bomb proof website. I mean, for the longest time, we didn't. There's countries that don't even have access to our website. It's a 404 error because they come from hot hacking, you know, a, a country that's known for hacker activity you know like russia if you're in russia you can't see our website so yay <laughs> <laughs> yay Foxies, my guy. <laughs> i get it but it's you know there's there's those levels of security but you know you hear yeah. these security breaches all the time or so-and-so's company lost all you know all this information that, who that, was it was like primary arms was who you didn't buy shit from because they would just oh no 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 optics finite optics finite would fucking your information would get stolen <laughs> I'm not going to say anything because they buy a fuck ton of stuff from us on the Ucon <laughs> side. But anyway, they're I don't all... buy anything from Optics Planet. No, no, 
no actual beef. Just they don't ever have anything I want. But you're not wrong. They're all Russians. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure all of Optics Planet is Russian. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, but I don't. Yeah. So. So we covered music, we covered merch, we covered drop culture, you know, we covered uh, disgruntled, you know, and you and I are both pretty much like wear our hearts on our sleeves, tell it how it is. And, you know, I've been real, <laughs> this is the 11th podcast. I haven't really complained about website related stuff, but it's, it's nice to offer perspective to people listening of what we actually do deal with on a daily basis. And then, you know, it's always like you have insurance or you know, this is the burden that you bear for owning a company. But I mean, it's tough, but it's also the most rewarding experience that I've ever dealt with. Um, you know, I get to employ people and I get to put food on their table and I love creating new things because it means that my guys are getting paid and the shop is growing and we're creating, you know, our own subculture within our industry that people appreciate and love. Absolutely. And um, you, you and I both answer a lot of questions for customers, and that's a free service that we do. We, you know, you do AMAs a lot. I do a lot of AMAs. Um, that That's something that people, a lot of owners of companies don't do. And it offers a level of transparency and perspective that a lot of, I, I get you get a lot of care packages from people that are just like, hey, man, here's a bottle of booze and a cool T-shirt from fucking Bucky's because what you do all day long and answer people's questions is fucking rad. You've saved me hundreds of dollars over the years because, you know, I almost made poor business or poor purchases because of what you do. And I that's the kind of shit, dude, that, like, keeps me coming back, keeps me doing those AMAs, keeps me, um, you know, wanting to help people because I do get – probably 20 or 30 messages a day thanking me for answering questions and helping them out. At least your customers like you, because my customers hate me. Um, and it's mostly all of Texas, because I just make fun of fucking Whataburger now. <laughs> <laughs> I used to design uh, cooking cooking appliances for Whataburger. <laughs> I, I helped design their griddle that cooks all those burgers. <laughs> That's fucking really fucking random, dude. Chick-fil-A, Popeyes, KFC, did it all. My favorite was uh, working on Saudi Arabian uh, KFC fucking machines because there's no safeguards in Saudi. So you're like, oh, they don't need this lockout, emergency lockout switch so their fire catches on fire and their dish dash goes up. Like, all right, this is tight. We don't need CE <laughs> to sign off on this. Cool. Off. There you go. This is what you wanted. This is what you get. <laughs> don't fucking need it. Different fucking planet they're on, man. Oh, yeah. It's like Mars. But, you know, it's cool. It's cool, though um dude your stuff is is your stuff i see it all over europe when i'm overseas and shit um sup stuff stuff i got i got dudes hitting me up uh they'll buy from you and ship it to me and then i export it over with other stuff um drop culture strong over in uk and poland and stuff like that they love it they love it they that's about all they're they're they can get after right now, right? I know some of those European countries they can own guns, but it's not the same as here. No, but I mean, it's it's the truth though. I've had dudes from different units hit me up, being like, "Yo, let's get on. Can we get a bunch of roadie uh, woobies from from Warm and Fuzzy on a on a unit order?" You know, and I pass that along to Warm and Fuzzy, and like, here here you go, spearhead this if you want to take the business. You know, like it's. It's big, dude. Drop culture and the kind of Gucci, Gucci gear, Gucci gang culture is is mm-hmm. strong. Um, you know, but I'm really happy you did touch earlier about like you know people don't really have hobbies coming into like people that are spectating the firearms industry from from social media and stuff. I I, I like guns because you can customize your gun to kind of create a projection of your individuality, and it's important to you. I used to like build guns and make them sexy and get them seracoded now i fucking hate it now i just like give me a fucking out of the box factory gun i'm a rattle can it and that's it like i don't i'm not gonna do that dumb shit anymore but people like that dude it gives them it makes it feel like i'm sorry uh it's our friend by the way justice from dermac but um oh the big homie a <laughs> big homie yeah I, he's he's calling me because i gave him grief we were talking about doing some stuff together and i got i sent him three different text messages and he never responded and i sent him hey bro are you just gonna keep fucking talking to me on social media but never return my call and he fucking called me right back so um but you know i'm, I'm really good at guilting people <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but no, it's it's one of those things, man. It's I I think that that too with the drop culture and the exclusivity of owning you know one of your t-shirts or hats that you're never gonna make again. You know, it makes people feel like they have something special to them at that moment. Oh, it gives them temporary gratification, and then the guns and stuff. This is my gun. This is why it looks this way. This is why it's this color. This is why it speaks to me. Like that's cool. That's super cool. Um, I do believe there's a level of toxicity there where people compare their, it's like a dick showing contest. Like, oh, well, mine's better because I use this compensator to use that. Con-. It gets toxic and people need to like realize that if you buy something because you think it's cool, it's because you think it's cool and be happy with it. Um, you don't need to have a reason to buy something or buy one of your shirts outside of just, it's fucking cool. Yeah. It's like tattoos, dude. You have some fucking pretty funny tattoos. Um, my favorite is when someone will look at my suit and be like, oh, well, what does that mean? And what does this mean? And why did you get this tattoo? And I was like, I did. Like, I did my first two pieces. I was like, this is dedicated to this dead person. And then after that, I was like, man, fucking tattoos are like the whole reason why I got a tattoo is because I think it's cool. Not like I can dedicate it to someone to justify to my parents why I got it. And it gives them a false sense of security as to, oh, he did it for this person, which is you're pretty much lying to yourself. To lie, to, you're, you know, you're lying to others and you're lying to yourself to try to convince yourself that it's okay to modify your body. But dude, you get tattoos because tattoos are fucking cool. And yeah. the same goes for drop culture and customizing your guns and exclusivity. I get it. Just don't spend seven hundred dollars on a hat on the aftermarket for it. It's fucking dumb. <laughs> Donate that money to a charity and wait for the next drop and buy another hat. <laughs> yeah, I, I, dude. It's it's wild. I I can't really com- I can't comment on it to the full extent because I get it. I'm into exclusivity. I'm into all these things. Um, but yeah, seven hundred bucks for a Patagonia hat that uh, that's that's wild. Just buy another one. <laughs> yeah, just buy <laughs> another I mean, fuck, one. There was there was forward hats up, and I think it closes on Monday. Like you can still be able to buy a hat from him. You know. And I, for one, actually know I'm going to spill this. So he, if he ends up listening to this, he'll be mad at me. But he's releasing more hats. I just saw the order. Yeah. No, I think he said that. He did a he did a AMA yesterday and was like, all like 30 fucking AMAs asking where the hats are. And it's just like a cartoon. I forget what cartoon character laying on the floor like, they're coming. Yeah. Just fucking, again, sign up for a newsletter. Impatient. Turn your notifications on. Patient. Am fucking patient. Here, I'm going to do an obligatory, like, story on Instagram real quick so that people know that we're actually fucking doing this. Hey, say hi. Titties. (laughs) Uh, It's... Man, it's always fun catching up with you because you're a busy fucking dude with everything that you got going on. But um, it's it's like yeah, this puts me behind by a week right now. Oh, <laughs> dude, definitely. <laughs> but it's one of those things that it's like it's kind of like we'll bump into each other like maybe once or twice a year, and we'll chat a few times a year. But it's it's always music and it's always throwbacks and it's always those things that are nostalgic. Like same thing with Tim, dude. We we're just it was like it was just fucking constant nostalgia. I love talking music because it just reminds me of it of an age where I was like, man, I'm going to punch this dude in the face and I know I'm not going to get in trouble for it. Yeah. It's the best. You're going to bro down. (laughs) You're going to get into a fight. You might accidentally punch a cop at a show and guess what? You might get away. (laughs) (laughs) I love when the cops show up and get in the pit and try pulling people off of, uh, pile ups and shit and they get kicked in the face and try to make arrests. And you're like, dude, why did you go in the pit? (laughs) Well, that's when the whole crowd kind of covers the person that accidentally tagged a cop and uh, helps them escape. Because why the fuck were you in the pit, bro? (laughs) You should have just thrown fists just like everyone else. I haven't been to a show in so long. Um, I can't even think of the last show I went to. You should uh, should come out for June 26th for Madball, for Death Before Dishonor, and Cruel Hand. And I think Albert might come. Albert Defense might come up. <laughs> oh man, that's rough. And it's at a tiny ass venue. It's gonna be so good. I the last last band I think I even fucking saw was. Did we see? Did we do? Did we see Lady Gaga, TJ? After McCartney. 
Last show I worked was Lady Gaga. I remember. Which, <laughs> so the last show I did was in the beginning of 2020, pre-Shot Show, right up until Shot Show. Yep. Those were the last shows I did. So that's the last artist I saw was Lady Gaga. But but previous to that, I had already seen her like 40 times. So. 40 times. Wow. Shit. Do you, <laughs> do you like Halsey too? <sighs> yes, but no. Um, that's, another, that's another artist I need to revisit. Um, because I think it was like a once over, like I just skipped right over to go to LDR, um, and I just stayed in in Lana Lana Land. But uh, I think I need to revisit. Do you it. like Lana's new album? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I like I like <laughs> dude. I like how every album is just a little is different. You know, it's like she's such a great entertainer. Yo, and for everyone listening, it's okay to listen to chicks singing. It doesn't make you a pussy. Okay. Mm-mm. And if you think mm-hmm. it makes you a pussy, you probably are a pussy. <laughs> uh, my heaviest deadlift, I think I pulled to uh, Lana. So, it makes sense. <laughs> Heavy weights. Yes. Lana Del Rey. It's it's cool, man. You can you can pretend like you're a tough guy all day long, but um, <laughs> if you don't listen to Taylor Swift like or Lana Del Rey, you're not tough. You're not tough at all. Um, yeah, any dude, like, anything else you want to fucking talk about? I'm I'm good, man. Um, if you want to hit me with more questions, how about this? Let's do another podcast in the future. That way, I can come back and we can continue this energy. Absolutely, I do have one cool thing to show you before we leave, so people will have to go to YouTube. But this is the 308 or 760 Ooh. by 51, 16 inch carbon fiber composite. Bren 2 machine gun. I put an AccuPower on it. So you told me how long did it take you to get that? Okay. <laughs> Real quick. I put this on order when it became available for order three and a half years ago. And then uh, someone, you know, either ATF fucked it up. And then the ATF redefined who writes law letters because it used to be chief and assistant chief, and then it became chief only. Um, so that kind of fucked it up. So after like a year and a half of waiting, it got bounced back. And then there was import issues. Then there was COVID. And then CZ might have lost my paperwork once. And then I had to resubmit again under a new chief. <sighs> It was a while. I think I've submitted three times over the course of three and a half years for that gun. And finally, oh. the stars aligned, and I finally got it. And when they called me, because I wasn't expecting it, they called me, and they're like, hey, your, your shit's here in country. And I'm like, really? I don't even okay. own a single fucking round of 760 by 51 right now. <laughs> that sounds about right. So you have something that I um, now own. Well, this is a little bit different. So I bought a P90. PS90, and I thought to myself, dude, I've always wanted one. If we're going to get an import fan, I'm going to buy something that is absolutely fucking imported. Can't find a fucking barrel. Can't get anyone to cut the barrel, which I figured out. And I was like, dude, fucking 5.7 can't be any more than fucking 70, 80 cents around. It's always been that much. And now it's $2.50 around. Holy fuck shit, what? No. No, because when the CIA, um, when the State Department dropped the P90 uh, a year and a half ago, uh, 5.7 Federal switched all their fucking 5.7, packaged it in American Eagle, and was selling it for 42 cents a round. I bought 12,000 rounds. Okay, so I'm going to need a link to some of this because currently I was buying um, 5.7 uh spear or gold dot sorry gold dot cheaper than i was able to find normal planking ammo jesus and people don't understand too the ammo is expensive because it has to go through a coating process each round is like coated in this weird slick shit um yeah uh it's mad expensive now and uh you know when that gun poops out 50 rounds of brass in three seconds it's like damn so fucking tight so it's a (laughs) hundred dollars a mag do you have a black and gray trigger group in yours um i have one somewhere don't worry about it cool (laughs) wink wink it's okay 
And we're not going to talk I about what ha- Black and Trey Gray Triggers are. I do have one. Um, I also own a couple of barrels. I have a barrel back on back order. Um, my gun's an actual S. It's registered as an SBR, right? So if the shit is, I formed one day, it came back, and it's still fucking 16 inches because who knows what uh, that barrel is. Talk to fucking Parker Mountain Machine. I believe he can turn those barrels. Well, I have one sitting at. Um, Either way, I have an actual factory FN that's cut. I'm just waiting to get it back. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Um, Jared was my go-to barrel dude for the weird shit, because uh, you know, turning fucking scar barrels isn't easy. So, as I've heard, yeah, I kind of want to cut that. I do and don't. I kind of want to cut that fucking Bren two down and put it in half by twenty eight. Because guess what? It's an M fifteen by one. Guess yeah, who probably makes, makes an adapter for that dead air. So hopefully, yeah. weird how that works. Yeah, because I just got a Sam Seven K pistol, um, formed it, did all this other bullshit, and apparently finding a four piece muzzle device for those fucking guns, twenty four one five right handed. Not a thing currently. Didn't know that. So if you have any, let me know. Yeah. Anyway, awesome, Corey. Thank you so much for being on episode. 11 of the AR Design Unholstered podcast. Uh, you fucking roll. Uh, tell everyone that you fucking hate them and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me, dude. Like I said, let's get another podcast going in the near future. We'll finish the rest of these conversations that we didn't get into depth. And uh, again, thanks for having me, man. Awesome. Thank you so much.